You want to move back a little bit because you're blocking my view. You're <laughs> <laughs> blocking my view. Well, good evening, everyone. We got a full house tonight. Why don't we uh, start with a word of prayer as you're taking your seats, and then we'll go right into the syllabus and the handouts. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to come together so that we can study your word and to cover this very important subject, free grace versus lordship salvation. And Father, our job is not to, our objective is not to make fun or take pot shots at uh, other views, but to find out what the view is based on the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So help us, Father, to focus tonight and uh, for the rest of the 14 weeks that we have together. If there's anything vying for our attention, I pray that uh, we would be disciplined enough to lay those aside so that we can concentrate on Thee, concentrate on Thy Word. We thank You so much for this opportunity, and at the same time we recognize that if we have any sins, we ought to confess them to You in the privacy of our hearts, knowing full well that You'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So thank You, Father, for the privilege and uh, the opportunity of uh, coming together this evening, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All right, well, I don't know if I have enough handouts. I wasn't expecting this many people. But for sure, could you kindly um, put your name, phone number, and email address? You have my word, I won't bug you at midnight. Um, and then uh, there's a question on the right side. If you have unlimited text messaging, would you prefer to be contacted via text messaging or email? Uh, so if you could kindly put that down. And it's, uh, that'll be your the roster. And I'll build a, a uh, thing on that. Rocky? You said that I did. I did. I said it. I said it. Everybody have a handout? At least, if not, we can share. Almost. I also emailed it, so if you have your phones and you have access to it, you can also look digitally. Did you email today? Yes. I emailed it today. I think I made it. I emailed it last night. Did you get today? All right, if you have your syllabus, just follow along with me so that we can uh, barrel through this. Uh, the course is entitled TH210. Free grace versus lordship salvation. If you don't know what free grace is or lordship salvation is, you'll know by the middle of this course. In fact, you might know by tonight. And although you may not have a position, uh, you might be surprised that you tilt in one direction or the other, just depending on what your church background is. Uh, the description is it's an all, it's an in-depth treatment of the Lordship and Free Grace views on soteriology. What's soteriology? That's a heavy word. It's a 50 cent word. What's study soteriology? Study of uh, salvation. Study of salvation. That's the technical <clears throat> word for soteriology or for salvation. And basically, you know, salvation is, we understand that to be born again, to be a believer in Jesus Christ. But um, as you all know, or some of you know, there are three tenses uh, to salvation, and we'll probably be covering some of this um, during this course. How is the Christian community to view a person who professes to believe in Christ and yet lives a life that is unchanged and worldly? 
If a person persists in sinful practices such as lying, stealing, sexual misconduct, hatred, etc., after professing to be a Christian, should the Christian community recognize them as Christians or should they be viewed as unbelievers who have deceived themselves? These are some of the issues that we will be addressing. So before we move on, you think that's an important question? Yes. Maybe you know someone in church who is living contrary to what the scripture says. <coughs> um, what do we do with those people? Do we conclude that they're not a believer in Jesus Christ? Do we conclude that they're not saved based on what we see? Is the evidence of this misconduct, this behavior that runs contrary to Scripture, is that empirical evidence that they're not born again? <clears throat> Rafi? Is it even really required for us to go down the path of either classifying them as, them as this, classifying them as that? Yeah. That's a more fundamental question. Yeah, that, that's mind. a good question. Does the Bible ever tell us to look at people to determine if they're sons or, and daughters of God? Does the Bible say, you know, look at people's lives to find out if they're a believer in Him or not? So that you can go after them and get them to acquiesce to Jesus? Does the Bible say that? No. It doesn't say that. So... No. Hmm? The Bible said by your fruit. James 2. Mm -hmm. By your fruits you will know them. Or Matthew 7. Um, I'm not sure if we hit that in our observation class. Um, but let's turn there quickly. I, I'll, I think that's... Oh, Matthew 7. Yeah, yeah. That's a good that passage because... Um, that tends to be a very popular passage that people go to to show that bad works is proof that a person is not really saved. So if we turn to Matthew 7, and those online, Matthew 7 is the passage that we're going to be looking at. Matthew 7. And for the, for the sake of those online, I'll... I'll read it from up here. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, for you will know them by their fruits. <coughs> right, Raphael, that's the one? You what know them by verse? What verse? Oh, Matthew 7, 15. 15. You guys couldn't read my mind? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> That's our next course. <laughs> Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are wolves, ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Going on, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not uh, prophesied? in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, uh, you who practice lawlessness. Now this passage is used to prove that we're supposed to bear good fruit. Right? Mm -hmm. Rafi? Well, look at the start though. Beware of false prophets. That's right. Look at that. He's talking about false prophets. He's not talking about a believer or an unbeliever. Correct. We're talking about false prophets. False prophets who come in sheep's clothing. Okay. So if I 
am a wolf. And I put on sheep's clothing and I mix with real sheep. Can you tell from a distance which one is the false sheep? Maybe no. not. Yes. In fact, even in close inspection, I would not know if the difference between a wolf in sheep's clothing and a real sheep. Yeah. Because you guys are mirror images. Yeah. yeah. Just close inspection, right? Yeah. Even in close inspection, you'll never know. And see, and see, the important thing is we, we want to start with what it's saying in the, in the text. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, the opening of, of this uh, passage here, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside are what? Wolves. Mm -hmm. So it can't be something that can be detected or discerned with the naked eye. My eyesight. Right. Because... It's a wolf that has sheep's clothing. Very excited by their fruit, you will know that. That's right. What's the fruit? Now we have to figure out what is fruit. Because first of all, it can't be something visible. <coughs> Why? Because he just got done saying they look like us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. If you go to Matthew 12, I want you to see this. Same author, same book, he defines what fruit is. Take a look at uh, 33 to 37. I'll read it uh, up here. Matthew 12, 12 33 to 37. Matthew 12, 37. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Sounds like Matthew 7? Mm -hmm. Okay. Root of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Yeah. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words. words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So it's talking about the fruit of a person's lips. You speak. So let me give you a good example. If I saw you in Costco, and I started to say, God bless you, how are you doing, I go to church, that doesn't tell you my background, right? You don't know if I'm a cult occult, uh, some kind of system or religious uh, belief, right? But it's, it's when I start to communicate something. If I tell you that all men are going to become gods, does that sit well with you, Raphael? Or did you know you're going to become a god? Mormon. You know now? Mormon. That's, what, that's what? Mormon. That's Mormon theology. Now, if I didn't have an elder Freddy here, and I started to teach that all men are going to become gods one day, and you will have your, he your own heavens, and you have multiple wives. I say, sign me up. He says, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, now how many of you would be able to tell that that's not lining up with Scripture? That's bad fruit. But on the outside, I can look like a pastor. I can look like a Christian. I can look like a believer. Because it's not what's on the outside that determines whether a person is lining up with Scripture. It's in what's in the abundance of the heart. The words will come as a direct result of what's in the man's heart. Right? So it's the words. And when you look closely again at Matthew 7, he says you can't tell. They've got clothing on. They, they look like us. So visually, you can't discern. But by their words, by their fruit, and the fruit is not their behavior. Second support for my answer is this. Did you notice what it says from 21 on? 21 down? Mm -hmm. In Matthew 7? Yes. Yeah. Look what it says. Lord, Lord... Um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So just because you name the name of Jesus doesn't guarantee entrance into heaven. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. Matthew 7, right? Matthew 7, verse 21. Correct. Thank you. It says, Not everyone, verse 21, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You can check in John 6, 40, what the will of the Father is, and that's to believe in the Son. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? What's the first one? Prophesy. Prophesy. Prophesy means to tell something in advance. Prophets of old in the Old Testament were able to tell, uh, speak an event before it would occur. The Lord say, thus saith the Lord, march around and, uh, and, and, and seven times around, and, and uh, what's, that, what's that one? Um, Joshua. Uh, trumpet. Yeah, the trumpet, but what's the, uh, oh, it escapes me at the moment. And he blows the trumpet, blasts the trumpet on the seventh so, time, and, and the, the walls came in, come. right? Um, so he was able to tell in advance what would happen, right? Prophecy is also something that happens like many, many years before it occurs. Probably. And, and what, you, what part of the human anatomy when you, you use to prophesy? Yeah. Lips. That's right. That's right. Okay, right? That's right. So, well, the idea here is, again, looking here, it says, uh, prophesy in your name. So, they were able to prophesy. They were able to speak of events that would occur before it would actually happen, right? They'd say, okay, this is what's going to happen a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. And he says, Lord, did we not uh, prophesy in your name? And then the next batch, cast out demons in your name. Anyone? DJ, do you cast demons out? Nobody casts demons out here, but even if you could, that doesn't ga that doesn't guarantee entrance into heaven, DJ. What's the context here? Are they complaining to God that they're not going to be in heaven? They're bargaining. Well, yeah, they're trying to bargain with God. Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Do signs and wonders in your name? See the con look at what it's saying here. We cast out demons in your name. Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. That's frightening. Here you've got three categories of supernatural events taking place. And Jesus Christ says, that doesn't mean I know you. It says, depart from me, I never knew you, those who practice lawlessness. It's the I never knew you that's key. You need to know him in order to have a relationship, in order to have entrance into the kingdom of God. But if you don't, but you've got all these good works, it doesn't matter. Now, is having good works a bad thing? No. No. But you have to first know Him in order to be able to do these good works so that you can stock up uh, rewards in heaven. Right. And if good works is born out of uh, you know, knowing Him mm -hmm. and executing His will and you know, applying the Word, yes. that qualifies, right? That's right. But it's, it's, the af it's an afterthought after believing. Before. Yeah. It always, it's part of discipleship. There's, a, you know, a Christian and a disciple, what we're going to see here, are different. Not all Christians are disciples, not all disciples are Christians. Proof of this is Judas, Judas Iscariot. He was a disciple, but he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a believer. All of them were clean in the upper room except for Judas. And so we know that it is possible to be a disciple, but not necessarily saved. Mm -hmm. Right? Again, Judas is an example of a person who was not clean, according to Jesus. John 13. Going back to the syllabus here, any thoughts or comments? I know we deviated slightly from that, uh, just so that you can see um, some of the things that we're covering.
right, the question is very proper. It's just a precursor of what so many see. things that sit out there. Yeah. If we really dig into it, yeah. it's actually using the wrong verses for the wrong thing times. What we've just looked at, we didn't spend a lot of time on this, but think about this, okay? This is a very important passage in Matthew 7. A lot of people are hanging their hat on this and saying, see, look at what it says. But the truth is, when you look at it closely in context, the only thing it's really communicating and conveying is, number one, make sure that whoever you're listening to has good fruit. Okay? The way that you can tell if they have good fruit is the words that they say should line up with the words coming from here. It doesn't matter if they have a lot of good works. It doesn't matter if they have supernatural works. It doesn't matter if they can cast demons out. Because apparently there were people who were holding on to that saying, well, didn't we do this? Weren't we good people? I mean, we, we can't do the kind of works that they were doing, and yet they don't make it. So that's why it's extremely important to make sure that we look at these things in context, in light of Scripture, in light of what's there in front of us, rather than just picking something and saying, oh, well, fruit. It means behavior. And it, I used to believe that too, because typical churches will say, well, you'll know them by their fruits. Or faith without works is dead. And so typically what you, you, you hear is that if you don't have good works, then that faith is dead. And if the faith is dead, you're not really a believer. It kind of runs like that in some of these uh, ministries. <clears throat> and knowing them by their fruit are the words that they speak. And knowing how to discern that... Mm -hmm. Is entirely proportioned in how much you know about the scripture. It takes time to develop a good vocabulary. You'll be able to step it out. That's right. That's right. And so our, our uh, responsibility as believers in Christ is to be familiar with the scripture. Because now he's warning us. First, in, initially the disciples. But even today. Are there not a lot of false teachings going on around us? There's a lot of, you know, there was a... Um, uh, an Asian Jesus Christ walking yes. around. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people out there claiming to be Jesus, um, you know, and fo and there are people following them. So what we have to do is be so familiar with the text of Scripture that we won't be duped into these things. And by the way, a lot of the cults were started because of a lack of knowledge of Scripture. People are so enamored and focused with spiritual phenomena that if they see an angelic being then it's got to be from God. So take for example the Mormon church. You know how it started? Uh, Joseph Smith was visited by an angelic presence, an angelic being. And he thought that was the real deal. And he said, well, God must be using you. And rather than questioning the angel and following the mandate and the, the imperative in Galatians 1, if someone were to come and preach a different message than what I taught you, even if it's an angel from heaven, let him be accursed or anathema. And he should have listened to what the angel was saying. The angel was saying, well, there is no good church, so you're going to start the church. All churches are anathema. And so if Joseph Smith would have just listened to the angel, he would have been able to say, well... Wow, that's kind of mean blasting all the churches. Um, but he didn't. And he didn't test the spirit. He didn't test the angelic being. Thus proving that these things can happen. An angelic presence. In fact, I've said this before. You know these TV shows where they have haunted houses and ghosts? I believe a lot of that is real. But rather than calling them ghosts, the scripture calls them fallen angels or demons. That is biblical. So when you see or hear noises, their job is to distract us and to get us so focused on these things that are happening that we, it takes our attention off of this and we go after the things that are exciting us, the things that are out of the ordinary, 
and so it captures our attention. So notice that these are, um, you know, again the question is, uh, what happens when you have this Christian who's uh, living like this, who have uh, sinful practices after claiming to be a Christian? Are they a Christian? You see? So, as we move forward, some of these questions and similar questions will be addressed. And we have to have an answer, because if we don't, then whatever you're currently believing in is going to come out and impact how you respond to your friend, your family member, or loved one. So, if your son, or your daughter, or your friend, or whoever is not consistently consistently lining up or living up to what the scripture says, what do we do? Do we automatically conclude that maybe they need to be born again? Maybe they didn't really respond to Jesus. Maybe they had a head faith, but not a heart faith. Have you heard that before? Oh, yeah. You miss heaven by 12 inches. <laughs> but the truth is, there is no head and heart faith. Faith is faith. <laughs> You know that? In Scripture, it's just faith. You either believe or you don't. But you don't miss heaven by 12 inches. And there is no distinction between this and this. But it preaches well. And so what we're going to do is look at some of these things and compare what we're hearing and line it up with Scripture. And then it's up to you to accept what the Scripture says or to maintain what you're most comfortable with. My job is just to show you what the scripture says, together as a class. This course objective, this course is designed to A, to encourage students to formulate and to develop their critical thinking skills about these important areas through readings, discussions, and class notes. Uh, the students should be, expect to be exposed to various approaches to theology as a basis for refining skills, such as proof texting. Proof texting is I'm going to show you this verse to support what I'm trying to prove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're not a believer because it says faith without works is dead. So here's the verse. Without considering the context. That's proof texting. An example. When biblical theology is looking uh, at verses and passages and context. It's different from systematic theology and historical theology. Biblical theology stays in one book focuses on the passage, it focuses on the one book. So like Matthew, we did the biblical theology. Uh, what's the fruit? We, we went to Matthew. We went from Matthew to Matthew. I didn't draw from Revelation or Galatians. So. And you know, it's such a sad state when somebody would, would pull a verse to prove his point. Right. And it's like, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And, and you know it, it's as long as we can compare what it says with scripture and then look at it together in context then you know let's, let's go for it so biblical theology is basically staying in one primary book um, contemporary case studies we're going to look at what's going on today altar call raising your hands coming down the aisle you know, it's not in the scripture, but yet a lot of churches teach it. A lot of churches promote it. Is it necessarily a bad thing? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But if we want to find out what the scripture says, that will help. Because actually, one time, an elderly gentleman said, I can't go down the middle of the Anaheim Stadium. You know, how am I going to get myself down there? Can I just do it here? And I said, sure you can, sir. And I said, but the way it was presented, we're going to keep playing this song until everybody gets off their seat and come here into the field. And you don't even know whether or not people are have panic. You know, they're, they're afraid to, to stand up in front of people. They're, maybe they came there all by themselves, and for them to leave their seat and go all the way down there, and they don't even know anybody. You know how frightening that is for someone who's just there by themselves? And this one gentleman who I just ran into because I was at this, he was actually angry. He said, well, who's going to help me there? How am I going to get down into the field? Now I can't go down there and 
and say uh, the prayer. And I said, well, sir, you could actually just pray right here in your own, in your mind, and right between you and God. And I realized that, you know, as much as that might be a good thing for some people, there's still a lot of people that can't. What about the people that can't go to the stadiums? What if the, peop what if the people get there and they find out the, it's packed and it's closed? Sorry, you, you can't, you can't uh, join us to this to this, uh, you know, outreach. They can't get saved. They got to wait till next year. And see, unfortunately, some people think like this. Mm -hmm. They think that unless I go down there, I'm not in. I actually have to do something. I have to get off my chair. I have to go down there. I have to profess, commit, repent. Or else, you know, if I don't confess before men, he will deny me before the Father. You know, and those are verses that we'll look at later on. DJ, are you going to say something? Yeah, I'm going to Okay. So, again, we'll look at these things because a lot of these are new. And again, new doesn't mean bad or negative. But we just have to find out what is it that they're actually communicating and is it something that lines up with Scripture. B, to encourage students to formulate personal conclusions <clears throat> to subjects and issues of personal interest with assignments and discussion. The student will be in encouraged to comprehend grace, recognize our security and position in Christ. I believe once saved, always saved. I don't think a believer can lose their salvation, even if they're to be a very bad person. I think it will tamper with his omniscience. God doesn't say, oh, I didn't know Freddie was going to be that bad. If I would have known, I wouldn't have given him salvation. <laughs> so now it threatens a number of things on God's end. But if he knows all things, and if he gives me salvation, then he knows that I'm not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. See? And so what I have to do is trust that over the course of time, I will grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. I'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the agency of God, the Holy Spirit, coupled with the Word of God. And see, one of the things that this class will do is to help the ones who are struggling, the ones who are having those difficulty living that Christian life, you know, well, you typically hear, uh, it's so hard to live the Christian life. How can we live the Christian life? It's so difficult. Well, covering uh, free grace and lordship, we'll be able to iron out some of these, these questions. So we'll recognize our security and position in Christ. We'll distinguish between works of Christ and the words of Christ. To me, that's a big deal. I, I put this out in 2007. I said, you know, when we were talking about the free grace issues, I said there's a difference between the words of Jesus Christ and the works of Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. And uh, but the the tension was on both. So we'll talk about that later. Communicate these truths to other. Letter C to be able to defend the free grace position upon completing this course. All right. Next page. Uh, required textbook is absolutely free. That's the title, not the book. I the book. Um, some were wondering, how come it costs money if it's called absolutely free? It's absolutely free. Yeah. Salvation is absolutely free, but the textbook itself is not. It should be. I like major Bible themes in all of our courses because we I tend to draw from it. Sometimes I'll, um, you know, print something out from his book, but if you have a copy of it, uh, you have it by your side, because you'll notice that a lot of this will line up with what he offers in his book. And if you don't, I would still encourage you to get it, because it's one of the best books to have. It's a one-volume um, book on systematic theology. It's eight volumes, basically, compressed into one. Okay. That should, we'll use it as a reference. Yes. This yes. one, the major Bible. Major Bible things. Yeah. Excellent book. Excellent book. 
And for those who like uh, recording, MP3, iPhones, iTouch, you know, Samsung tablets, whatever, I'm all for it because if, you, if it'll help you retain it, then by all means. And by the way, these are recorded in MP3, video, and we're streaming it. On the course schedule, here's the assigned reading. So tonight we're supposed to cover pages 15 to 33. Looks like some of you have your books, so <clears throat> which is good. But I don't know if you read it. No. More than likely you didn't read it. So maybe we'll start it tonight. And I'll hit some high points. And then we'll uh, combine that with next week. So tonight we're supposed to look at uh, pages 15 to 33. And then next week, uh, 37 to 43, do you believe this? And then what really happened? No return trip, school days, dropping out, the royal battle, uh, shield of faith. The choice is yours, and then there will be a little break there from December 13th to January 3rd. We'll, our winter break will be then. We'll resume class on January 3rd, Dining with Jesus, Repentance, Justified by Works, Why Do You Call Me Good, and then on January 31st, that's our last class together, Our Living Lord, and then there will be a presentation of papers. Uh, if you're planning to do this for credit, basically what I'm looking for is anything out of the textbook itself. So let's say you want to talk about faith. What is faith? What is repentance? What is salvation? What is a disciple? Compare it with a, a Christian. And so a two-page paper and uh, presented on the last day of class for those who are doing this for credit, um, or if you want to take one grade drop and you don't want to share it, you can turn it in. Is it faith and salvation different? Yes, faith and salvation is different. Very good. Very good. Any thoughts, comments, questions regarding the direction of this course? The class is free, right? Class is free, it doesn't cost anything, just the time. Absolutely free. <laughs> absolutely. It's absolutely free. Okay. These are geared for uh, academic studies. This is kind. Of, this is the format of a seminary. Uh, this is how I'm treating it. So you know, um, you'll get the most out of this class if you read the assigned readings, so that you can interact with the content. See? So, but don't let this intimidate you. Maybe you might be wondering if you can hang with the class, and you can. It's, you know, we take it slowly, um, but we go through it thoroughly, and a lot of times you'll ask questions uh, either in class or even via email. But, you know, this is for your edification. You're, you're doing this to strengthen your relationship with God. Maybe this is all new to you, and, you know, if you're growing in something new, that's good. Uh, can you use it later on? I hope you can, and I believe you can. Is this going to be a uh, help you with your walk with Christ? I would say yes, certainly. So if that's meaningful to you, and if that's important to you, then stay to the end. Stay all the way through, because we're going to learn a number of things here. So having said that, let's turn to page uh, 15. I'd like to rod mockers forward. Yes. Yeah. Rod mocker is... Uh, Solid frequency. Maybe for tonight, let's uh, let me just read a couple things here. In one of his most unforgettable parables, the Lord Jesus describes the spiritual awakening of the prodigal son in these words. Luke 15, 17 through 19. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So, this life is no good, the prodigal was saying to himself. And so you, you can see that uh, in his thinking, uh, he finally hit rock bottom and he wants to go back home. But what's the concern? Well, you know, when you read the rest of it, 
he's not sure if his father will take him back. You know why? Because he wasn't he wasn't a good son. He, he, did, he did a number of things that were not really the right thing. He made poor decisions. DJ? Yeah, if you look at the text, he didn't even care when he goes back, just asking to take him as his son. Yeah. He just want to go, go back as a servant. He wants to go back as a servant, correct. Rafi? There's humility. There's humility. In fact, we'll go to that uh, passage. Rafi, you have something? He just stepped back in the beginning of that parable. Yeah. The father right. and the son. Mm -hmm. There's already a relationship there. Yeah, there is. Just think about that. Yeah. Well, you, you know, what he says here, let me just read it since uh, you brought that out. If you look at uh, page 17, those who hold to a lordship view will respond with the following. Look at the bottom of page 17. It would be difficult to imagine a conversation like this between a father and a son. Son, Dad, am I really your son or am I only adopted? Well, young man, it depends on how you behave. If you really are my son, you will show this by doing the things that I tell you to do. If you have my nature inside of you, you can't help but be obedient. Son, but what if I disobey you a lot, Dad? And the father says, well, then you have every reason to doubt that you are truly my son. This is what some ministries teach. You see? It's, it's, uh, you look at the top of 16. Let me just... Uh, maybe look at 15. The prodigal son was wrong with his thinking, right? He was thinking his father wasn't going to take him back. What he imagined was that he could strike a bargain with his father. If his dad would allow him to live at home, he would work for everything he got. But that was not his father's idea at all. Instead, he was eagerly waiting for his son to come back to him. Remember? The father was waiting. And what happened when the father saw the son? He ran. He, did he run away from the son? Towards the son. No, he ran, he ran towards, towards the son. Because of the love that the father has for his son. Now why is this important to know? Because this actually is speaking about us. Our See, father. Yeah. God the Father is always willing and desiring that we would come back home. Mm. We might go down that path and live like the prodigal. And when we do, this story is supposed to remind us that the matchless grace and the love that the Father has for His child is beyond all comprehension. The mm -hmm. Father is constantly waiting for us to come back. Now, we can live in such a way, live in sin, to the point where we start talking like this guy, and we start to wonder, well, you know, I'm sure I'm not a son anymore. Especially with the, the things that I've done. No way. I wonder if I can strike a bargain. And that's what uh, Hodges is saying here. He was eagerly waiting for his son to come back, and he was fully prepared to receive him without any conditions at all. Did he say anything like, you know what, did I, do you see how dumb you were? See, you weren't listening to me? Did you learn your lesson? That sounds like us today. We're quick to tell our kids that, right? Yeah. See, did I you learn you your so. lesson? I told you so. <laughs> Who are you going to listen to next time? And we, we rub it in. Even the following day, we're still, did you learn your lesson? Yeah. Right, Rafi? I do it to that all the time. <laughs> The Father's loving acceptance would be granted absolutely free. And so, in fact, let's, uh, this would be a, a good time to go to that passage. Let's open our Bibles. And we'll pick this up next week as far as the reading. So next week, please have this portion, tonight's reading, and next week's. So we can go through it. Since you guys, some of you just got the book. So, 15 to 43 next, next week. But let's turn to Luke 15. That's be a good way to... We've got 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Luke 15. We'll look 
look at verses 11 to 32. I'll be reading uh, for those online. It'd be easier. Now, and listen closely and see what you can see here. Make some observations in your mind's eye. Then he said, Luke 15, 11, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Not many days later, or after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with what? Prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. That's just another way of saying, oh, man, I'm hungry. I'm starting to feel it in my, my belly. Right? There's a famine going on, and uh, I'm, I'm hungry. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. You see why I concluded that he was hungry? Because in verse 16, he was eyeing the, the food of the swine. You know what? That looks pretty good. Those pods? I, don't know. I bet it's healthy. It's natural. Right? He's probably reasoning inside. And when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and he will, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So you can see the angle of the son, right? He's in a lot of pain. He's thinking about this. This didn't actually happen yet. Right? He's, he's uh, turning this over in his mind. If I go to my dad, this is what I'm going to say. You see, this is why I, I've always said that we constantly are talking to ourselves, whether we know it or not. Uh, and he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And what? Right. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he didn't even get to finish what he was preparing for. What else was he supposed to say to his father? Make me as your hired servant, right? Hey, Dad, you know what? Uh, or sir... You know, I know you don't want me, you probably won't accept me as your son anymore, but if you, can I work for you? And would you take me as a hired servant? He didn't get to, to say that part. Why? Because the father is all over The father is already all over his son. The father didn't give him an opportunity to say that. Notice, it says, he, the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Everything's covered. He's clothed and he's got this ring. He's got sandals. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry or happy. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Does the story end there? No. no. Look what happens next. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He said, oh, I wonder what the occasion is. Hmm. Music and dancing, huh? So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant, and he said to him, your brother has come and because he was, has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. 
So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as a son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. What's going on here? Jealousy. Jealousy, there's a lot of things, right? What, what do you notice here? What stands out? What do you see? <laughs> Different perspectives. Different perspectives, right? You've got the younger son's perspective, you've got the father's perspective, you've got the older son's perspective. We might be able to identify with one of them, or both, two of them, or maybe all of them. Just depends, right? But what's going on here? So this son leaves, and he squanders his money, and he blows it on a lot of things, prodigal living, right? Did you notice how long it took before he actually left? A few more days. Verse 13, not many days after, we made this observation uh, the first time we uh, looked at this. All we are doing is looking at the text. Is that significant? Is that a significant detail? And I would say yes. Because here's this son who wants to get out of the house, but it says, <coughs> not many days after. Why was there a delay? Well, he has money. He's got cash now from, you know, or at least uh, that which uh, his father gave to him, divided up, roughly. Uh, I can only infer, but uh, was he decided exactly what he's going to do with the money? Uh, maybe he maybe, wasn't. Maybe he wasn't. Yeah, maybe he wasn't. I mean, you know how it is. You're going to leave the home. I'm, I'm tired. I'm getting out of this house. He was preparing for the journey. He has to sell all the material stuff. Uh, convert it into cash. Okay, <laughs> so he's going to take the material stuff and convert it to cash. Okay, that's a possibility. Well, now that he has, I mean, I'm sorry, now that he has all this money, he's probably gaining lots of friends and they're probably the ones that convinced him to go somewhere now. Yeah, hey, it's nice. been a long time, Freddie, let's hang out. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll treat you guys. Oh, you will? Uh, maybe he's just taking his time to think about which towns he's going to paint red. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he's, you thinking. know, thinking, well, do I really want to leave? I noticed my dad didn't resist. He just gave it to me. Why did he just give it to me so quickly? Before my time. You don't get this until you're older, uh, Arlene. Well, I was thinking maybe he wanted to stay, but then... There's a rivalry between brothers. Then he decided to leave. Okay, maybe there's <laughs> rivalry, or maybe that could have jump started him. And he could have left too. Who knows? Well, all, all I can say is we don't know. It's not in the text. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not, we don't. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Not, it's not in the text. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, like this is all good speculation. Yeah. It, it's all observation. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I uh, champion observation because I would rather spend time working with something that's in the text than inserting something that's not in the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind spending time observing these things and saying, hey, uh, why does it say not many days after? And yes, we might start speculating and we don't have anything concrete, but what that does is it forces you and you and you to look closely at the text. You're not drawing from Dr. Seuss and what did Matthew Henry say? What did Charles Ryrie say? Now it's what Murley says, what Winston says, what DJ sees, based on observation. So you write your commentary. Okay, you know, a prodigal son, a man had two sons, and he asked his father to give him what belongs to him. And guess what? You notice that it was not uh, many days afterwards, or many days, uh, what's it say? Yeah, not many days after, the son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. 
So you, you write your own commentary and say, you know what, did you notice that it took him several days before he actually left the presence of his father? Going back to commentary, why draw from somebody's comments and why don't you make your own comment? Yeah, that's right. And you can make a good comment or commentary, your own personal commentary, when you make observations. What do you think a commentary is about? It's their observations. So when you're learning how to observe the text, you can create what you see. You can jot down what you see. See? So what else do we see here? What's going on in Luke 15? So you've got this man, he has two sons. What's going on? One wants He's living a sinful life. Okay, he's living a sinful life. Okay. After he left the house. After he left the house, he lived it up, he did what he wanted to do, he partied it up, Rafi. It's a volitional act for him to party it up. It's a volitional act. Okay, so let's dig deeper now. So did the father stop him? No. Okay. So the father didn't stop him, that means he won't stop you. Mm-hmm. That means he won't stop your son, he won't stop your daughter, he won't stop your relative, he won't stop your husband, he won't stop your wife or your uncle or your aunt. Because he will give us the opportunity to exercise our free will. This is clearly in the passage. The father could have stopped him if he wanted to, but he didn't. So we can learn, we can see something here, that the father will not get in our way. If we stomp our feet and say, you know what, I'm tired of this Christian life thing. I'm tired of reading the Bible. I'm just, I'm, I'm so fed up with a lot of things. I just, I just want to do what I want to do. And nobody can stop me. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. It's found in Luke 15. He said, give me what belongs to me and I'm out of here. I'm going to live the way that I want to live, not the way that you want me to live. And he did. It's called prodigal living. And the father said, uh, I wish you wouldn't do this. But, you know, the door is open. If you must, you must. And we can see, as you know, we've seen already, that the Father is always waiting. So when we start making observations, we can connect the dots and re see and realize that, you know what? This is kind of like my story. This is like my life. God will never stop me. I have to make a decision. I have to want to be with Him. He won't make me stay with Him. He won't make me go to church. He won't make me study the Bible. He won't make me pray. I can do exactly what I want. That's clearly the evidence in here. See? <clears throat> Look at what happens. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, he wanted to be far away from his own father. When you get to that point, that means you, the relationship is strained, mm. right? There wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be hungry or in want. Probably. There arose a famine in the land. That's right. So you can see how God will orchestrate things. Exactly. Not you. So now, now well, look, there, okay, what's it say? Um, he spent all, so he, he goes like this, and nothing comes out, and then all of a sudden there's a famine in the entire land. And he's hungry. Now you're in an awkward position. You don't hear anything about the friends anymore. Right? So, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to, sweep, to feed swine. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. You think he's hungry? He wanted to eat the food from the swine and the pigs. That was a part of his job to feed the swine. Now, would you consider 
this section of the events the start of discipline, or would you classify it as punishment? Yeah. I'm, th I'm just throwing it out there, right? For people to think. Sure. Discipline or punishment? And is there a difference? So, whom the Lord loves, He disciplines. So, uh, or judgment, right? Uh, look at this. He says, uh, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? Do you notice that? How many of, the ser how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough, meaning enough to take care of them, and spare? That's extra. Mm -hmm. So I've got bread to take care of me, plus I've got extra. So the father is even taking care of the servants. Very generous. Mm -hmm. Right? Rafi? Uh, it's maybe he's thinking, oh, maybe if I can come back, I'll take one to spare. Maybe. Right? Doesn't it doesn't say anything. Uh, doesn't say that's right, and he says so. I have uh, they have bread enough and spare and to spare, and I perish with hunger. Here's a guy who's suffering uh, and with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now he's ex he's expressing this. He's thinking this. This is a volitional act. He's not in front of his father. He's just thinking this. The scripture is giving us uh, a picture of what's going on in his mind. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's reviewing this in his mind. In verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So what can we conclude here about the father? He must have been waiting for a son. He's waiting for a son. Very good. For and the him. love of, of the father is so huge. Yeah. For his son. The, the love for the father, uh, from the father, is huge. Right? That's great. Unconditional. And Teta, were you going to say something? Forgiving. Forgiving. Right? Forgiving. And uh, so he says... Um, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven, and, and in your sight, and no longer worthy to be called your son. What else was he supposed to say, though? I'm sorry. He's supposed to say, I'm sorry? What did he role play? What was he saying in his mind? Make me a servant. Make me a servant, like a hired servant. But it's not here. The father cuts him off. The father says, uh, Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and was alive again. He was lost, was found, and they began to be married. So you can see that he was rejoicing at the return of his son, DJ. From what I see, he tried to fix it by himself. He did. When he was um, contemplating going back, it's like, I'm just going to work for my dad. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, you have to think about this. He's lived such a prodigal lifestyle that he knows that if his dad found out or his dad knows, he knew, I'm sure, based on what the son said, he probably wouldn't even be open to having him come back home. That's what he was afraid of. So he had this brilliant plan, you know, I know you won't accept me as your son, but how about as a hired servant? I know the house inside out. You know, I'll take half the pay. You know, and I know uh, things that the servants don't know. You know, he was ready to, to reason and bargain with his father. And notice what happens here. His older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So, um, notice the, uh, it says he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. So, Apparently, there was a, a party going on, right? And so it caused the older son to wonder, what in the world is going on here? Why, why the partying and the dancing? Coffee? 
Um, I just want to highlight that you know when the son was in his dire in dire straits, mm -hmm. as he started thinking, mm -hmm. he's formulating a plan of just bargaining. Yeah, that's father. right. Bargaining. In his mind, oh, right? yeah. How many times have we done that? Mm -hmm. Lord, if you just help me this one time, uh -huh. yes. starting tomorrow, <laughs> I promise. I'm going to start reading this. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. Right? Starting tomorrow, I'm going to start going to church. Right? It's like the, the ten lepers. The ten lepers were healed and only one came back. Okay. See? So... Um, but we have to remember, you know, I'm sure if we spent some time and we reflected on how many times God has saved us from problems, then we would probably be shocked. First of all, He saved us from the worst problem, which is the lake of fire. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never have to worry about that. That's your worst problem. And that was handled successfully by Jesus Christ. You don't have to worry about that anymore. And if he took care of that, which is the greatest problem, well, couldn't he help you with the smaller problems in life? Mm -hmm. And the answer would be yes. Why? Why would he help you with the smaller problems? Because you're a son or a daughter of, of God. See? Look at what else it says here. And he said, verse 26, So he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean, or what these things meant. He said to him, Your brother is coming because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So who went, who went where? The father went out. Went to him. So why did the father have to go out? Because he wouldn't come in. The, the older son was really upset. Yeah. He would not go inside and join the party. Imagine how, have you ever been in a, in a party or a family gathering and you're so upset that you just stay outside? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then one of your family members come out, come on, just, just let it go, ignore it. You don't want to spoil the fun, the gathering. Please, for the sake of Lolo or Lola or whoever. And that's exactly what's going on here. The father is rejoicing because his son is back. And that says a lot about how God thinks and views us in spite of how we lived our lives or how we're currently living or how we used to live. It doesn't mean that we can live the way that we want and come back. I'm just saying that if you look closely at the Father's love for us, that alone should motivate you to want to be with Him on a regular basis. And how do we do that? The intake of His Word. Because just like a relationship, even among friends, you started off as just a friend, but then over the course of time, you become best of friends. The only way it was able to move from a friend to a best friend level is time. Time invested. you got to spend time with that friend. So that all of a sudden, when you get to over here and now you're best of friends, you'll do anything for that best friend. You give the shirt off your back. They need a place to stay, you want to borrow my car, you, your car broke down, you need to get to work, here's the keys. But if it was still over here in the beginning, you're not going to loan your car out. And that's the key for us as believers. We've got to take our relationship with Christ away from just knowing Him here. We've got to crank it all the way to where He's like our best friend. And when we know exactly what He has done for us, when we study His Word and we discover all that He's done for us, we can't help but reciprocate. That's what a relationship is built on. Coffee. You know, with what you just said, from friend to best friend relationship, mm -hmm. again, the, the key word you said is knowing Him. Yeah. It's not working towards to please Him. 
No, no. no. It, it's, it's, it's all about a relationship. Strong relationships will, you know, the natural byproduct of a strong relationship with a person, a friend, a relationship, is your activity. You will do things. You will encourage, you will support, you will help, mm -hmm. you will assist without really thinking much about it. Right? If you don't like uh, <coughs> knitting, but your friend needs you there uh, for a few hours, more than likely you'll go because your best friend needs you. Your best friend is down, depressed, and all she can do is knit. He says, I want you to sit with me for three hours while I knit. Under normal circumstances, you may not. But because your friend needs you, you might just comply because you love your friend. In other words, you'll do anything for your friend. Greater love is no man than this, that a, a man lay down his life for his friend. And that's really speaking of Jesus Christ. He laid his life down for us, as friends. So notice, he said, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father's killed a fatted calf. He was angry and would not go in. His father came out and begged him, pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgress your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Any observations here on verse 29? Comparison. Comparison? Mm -hmm. What do you see? We pick the good uh, with son and uh, bad son. Good son and bad son. Right, Rafi? <laughs> I wouldn't classify them as good son and bad son. I mean, the guy, the guy that came back from painting the town red. If you look at it, that's a bad son. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wouldn't classify it good or bad. Yeah. But look at how how the the older son reacts. Yeah. He's mad, right? The Why? older son is mad. Why? Jealousy. Jealous. Yes. Why was he jealous? He, he wasn't getting what? He wasn't getting enough attention. Okay, he wasn't getting enough attention, or he, all, he actually said, uh, what did he say? You never gave me a... Fatted cow. Fatted cow. You didn't give me a goat, fatted cow. For what, though? For what purpose? So he can fire with his friends. Notice the difference here. The father killed the fatted calf to celebrate their homecoming of the son, to share with the family and servants, those who were a part of the, the, the domain of the father. But this son said, well, I never had an opportunity, you never killed anything for me so that I can party it up with my friends over here. The direction is different. The father wants to share with everyone that's there, family. The older son didn't want to share it with his family. He wanted to share it with who? With his friends. With his friends. Many, many common circles in this parable would just concentrate on the prodigal son. They would. But they would never take into consideration the back end verses that completes the that's whole right. parable. That's right. There's a lesson there. And in that same verse, he said, uh, the next verse, he says, uh, uh, This son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with what? Harlot. Think about What's a harlot? Prostitute. You go to Hollywood, San Francisco, these places that are popular with, with prostitutes. Think about that. If your son goes out and spends his money and your older son finds out somehow that your younger son is sleeping with prostitutes or he's spending his money on prostitutes. And he's trying to sting his father and say, look at this. Did you know that your younger son spent the money that you gave him on those? You killed a fatted calf for him? Did I ever do that? Kind of looks like another believer striking back at another believer. That's, that's typical of the church, too. 
yeah. right? In some ways, when someone comes back to church after so many months or even longer, what do they do? Well, what's, what's Freddie doing here? Maybe he wants to mooch. <laughs> he's got a, there's, he's up to something. Keep an eye on him. How about me? Some people think like that. And uh, you can kind of see it here. Although the context is different. Context here is the son comes back. He was embarrassed. He was ashamed. And he said, Father, you know, or he wanted to say, well, if you take me as a hired servant, I'm willing. I know that I was a bad guy. And the other details that the, <coughs> the older son here provides seems to support that. That here he spends all this money and part of it is on harlots. And he's saying, as soon as this son of yours, notice how he calls him your son. Yeah. Very select, brother, selective in words. Yeah. You know, when my brother came home, this is what you, he said, your son. Your son, yeah. There's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. yes. Your son, of, the son of yours says, uh, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlot, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. <coughs> so how can that encourage us? All that I have is yours. Uh, all that I have.